Thank you for tuning in to Stampscaping 101. Here is the mood and media video number one, two, three, four, five, six. I wanted to do a introduce a new uh, medium to the the series, and that's the white gel pen. But we haven't done a winter card yet. Okay, not all winter cards have to have like you know falling snow, but I wanted to do that in this one and to go with some really vibrant um, and deep full range of blue tones in here, okay? And again, it is using the glossy cardstock, but you can do this on a matte cardstock. I don't know if it would get this dark because you, you know, matte cardstocks tend to absorb, you know, your inks as opposed to kind of having it sit on the surface a little bit more, but... Um, uh, a really fun scene to do. It's you know the same technique as all the previous scenes that I've been doing, but just introducing a new medium like this and look how you know that can really bring the scene to life, you know, and to give it some extra energy and contrast and certainly texture in the form of that white gel pen. So a lot of fun to do. And uh, with fall right around the corner from us, that's when a lot of us start thinking about, some of you start thinking about, you know, your holiday cards in the summertime, but a lot of us, you know, start thinking about it and start doing them in the fall. So, hello to fall. And as far as those paper crafters and stampers go, hello to um, at least starting to think about our holiday cards. So, anyways, if you choose to watch the video, I hope you enjoy it. Okay, fall is right around the corner, and fall is when a lot of people start thinking about holiday cards. I'm going to do one right here, and we're talking about some blue tones. I'm going to do kind of a snowy scene, not that you can't have snow during um, daytime, but I'm going to do it um, kind of at nighttime, or I don't know, kind of twilight or something like that, night. and. In order to do something depicting um, something, you know, a cool weather scene, all it means is just kind of altering your color scheme. I'm going to be working in a range or a, a value scale of different blues. And uh, I thought I would throw in this Caribbean blue. It's a little bit of a warm blue, uh, which I usually don't include with this uh, color scheme. But in this one, I don't know, I want to go for something, I want to add something in there a little bit different, okay? And I think in this one we are going to start branching out a little bit and work with some different media. So I'll be working with some dye-based inks, but in order to add that snow I do like to use a white gel pen. And there's other things you can do, uh, add, you know, something depicting snow with as far as media goes. But. Um, this will be the first one in this mood and media series. Okay. I won't go overboard. I, I think I'm going. I, I really like using, um, you know, pigment ink um, it, uh, touches in my scenes, and uh, I'll hold off on doing that one. I'll do a lot of that um, later on uh, when I finish. Uh, a large grouping of uh, scenes or down or different compositions. Okay. Stamping this all in black. And once again, this is on the glossy cardstock. And like I said, I always mention this in these uh, scenes, but I will be doing um, these scenes on some matte cardstock so we can do a little comparison contrast. Uh, types of looks. Hmm, maybe the gray might be interesting in this as well. All right, now this scene's going to get fairly dark, okay? Now just in my, uh, as in my previous card, um, I think I'll just leave the surface of this water as is. Who knows, maybe this water, you know, has um, iced over or something like that. We'll try to make it as cool as possible. That being said, uh, maybe I shouldn't have done those you know, ripple reflections down here. I could have just stamped it out without them. But I already did, so no big deal. Okay, so let's line up our pads in what we see as being, you know, light to dark. Okay. 
I do have this other summer sky here from Memento as well. If you had something like this, it would look like this. Light, medium, dark, and you can certainly mix and match, okay? Like something like this. A lot of these colors are fairly similar. Um, the indexing on them is really similar, but I just know that from use, you know, using these, the mementos seem to me that when you apply them, they're a little bit lighter than what they look like on the uh, the indexing sticker. But, you know, I don't know. Maybe if you use them in a real, real full saturation, but the way that I kind of lay my inks down in this kind of uh, color application process, it, they're a little bit lighter, um, you know, with that kind of wiping and dapping with the uh, the sponges. But that being said, one of the things I always kind of preach is uh, in these videos is if if you're doing this kind of layered dye based ink technique and you have a really light shade of some hue, okay, I'd recommend um, a really light blue, maybe tan or something like that because browns are often used in uh, scene stamping, um, a pale yellow, nothing too bright and um, like a pink. So what you have is blue, pink, and yellow, and those kind of represent uh, your primary colors. If you have kind of a reinker of some line of some brand, doesn't have to be the same brand or anything like that, those are a good foundation set there. You can always mix your yellow and blue together, or just layer them over the top of one another, and you get green, blue, and... Um, pink form a nice violet, and uh, of course uh, the um, pink and the yellow would form an orange. So you'd have, you know, you'd be able to mix um, kind of a foundation color for any color scheme that you're going after. Okay, and also when you have these uh, um, reinker um, inks, bottles, whatever, um, when you add them to your applicators like this, it really gives you a really saturated, thick layer of uh, application of um, ink. And the lighter colors do get a lot of coverage, so it's really convenient to do a real quick and easy application of tone, okay? Now look at this. Now see, I will leave some of my white of the paper, okay? <laughs> Maybe I filled up too much, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't have used so much reinker fluid, but um, just to show you that this can be a pretty quick and easy process. It's a, it's a little bit fat. Well, I would say in this case, it's a lot faster than dabbing and going, dabbing, going, dabbing, going, dabbing, going. You know what I mean? It takes a little while sometimes. So if you have kind of a lighter tone, um, lighter value hue, okay? And when you're using those kind of primary colors, you can kind of use, you know, you have your choice of what you want to use. You know, if it's a green colored meadow, you can use the blue on there because once you go over with the yellow, you'll get a green, uh, a green out of it. Or you can use the yellow as a foundation. Then you go over it with greens, you get kind of a yellow greenish, you know, tinge, if you know what I mean. But this is a quick and easy way to get your color, your page, not only saturated, um, really good, but you get that coverage real fast, okay? Um, I don't know, maybe I use too much of that. Okay, that, don't use that much ink. But even so, you know, it's, it's not that much. It was a few dro drops and I was ready to go. That being said, now, because I got that amount of coverage, um, I can kind of bypass some of these tones. Like I can bypass this one right here. Let's check out the Bahama Blue and see if that shows up. Now I'm going to be using the same tip right here and it has a lot of the, uh, in this case it was the Aqua, um, Adirondack Lights Aqua, or the Seashells Ocean Aqua before they changed the names. And that's before they discontinued both of those, but um, let's use this Bahama Blue. Okay, it's a little bit darker. So yeah, I, if I really dab it in, you can see how dark it will get, okay? See that right there? But it's really super slippery now. You kind of want that out of your page, your 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 card, your application, okay? You do want it kind of slippery because you can really spread out those medium to dark tones very easy, okay? And you can use 
they're kind of that was my kind of when these um, Adirondack lights came out, or they were called seashells before. Okay, now that being that those are Ranger inks, okay, and like Ranger inks, like most inks out there, they're pretty thick in terms of their viscosity, their you know relative thickness, okay. So they do kind of add on to glossy cardstock, and they'll blend out really quickly, okay. But what I did when those colors came out, those Adirondack ones, or rather the seashells ones, okay, meaning those really like, they were shadow stamping inks, you know, they, I know it's confusing, they changed the names from seashells to Adirondacks, um, lights at one time, and uh, just, I don't know, for marketing purposes, that it matched their very popular Adirondack um, line of inks. Um, but basically there were shadow stamping inks, and what I would do is, you know, when those came out, and I don't know, when I kind of figured it out, I, I started using the Adirondacks, or those light colors, the shadow stamping inks, okay? And, and then, after I used those for a while, I was using the pad versions of them, what I'm getting at. Um, and then when I thought, okay, those are perfect because when people are adding colors, they have to add a lot of it down for it to show up because they're so light, you know, shadow stamping inks. By the way, if you don't know what shadow stamping inks were, they were just very, very light values of any given hue that they, you know, were depicting, okay? They were like 5%, 10% um, gradations or values of a, a given hue. So the blue would be a, like a 5% blue. And you could barely see it when you were adding it in there, so they had to add a lot of it down, which is the main purpose of that first color of ink, okay? Because I knew that when they got to your darker inks, even if they did something like that, okay? That's, the, you know, that's the thing that people kind of ran into that they, you know, really bothered them. I know that um, if they have a good foundation of that first color, okay, that no matter what, they did with the darker colors, it would just blend out perfectly, okay? It was no problem, so. Anyways, long story short, or I don't know, short story that made long just now by me. Um, I switched over that reinker for their first colors. They laid it down, and I never had to worry, you know, I, I didn't have to, fit, you know, help people to blend out, you know, a thumbprint looking thing because it just it blends out just fine and easy you know um, after they get that base layer down so that was my secret kind of workshop um, weapon it's not really secret I told everyone to do it and that's what I'd always preach that's what you should do you should get a really thick layer of color down so not only coverage but it's for saturation it's kind of penetrating your paper a little bit and kind of moisturizing the pulp, you know, getting some of that uh, moisture into the pulp of the paper so that it makes every other color that you'll ever do in this process after that first layer so much easier to blend into your scene, okay? So I can go like this, and it's kind of slippery. I can kind of use this technique, you know, and I'm not getting shapes everywhere. Okay, now this is glossy cardstock. It's not matte, so don't do this on the matte. I don't know, maybe you could. Um, but, um, I don't know, it just, it makes everything just really easy. It takes all the guesswork out of it, you know. So this right here, I can just kind of blend it out, and it's, it's super, you know, easy gradation right there. So there's no kind of marks, you know, as far as like, you know, like this type of thing right here, see that? This is on, you know, just dry paper, so it's kind of the direct opposite of this one. This one's kind of moist, so that just wipes out, okay? Now, I wouldn't recommend doing this type of, you know, technique right here, right? That's not what you want to do, but it's just to show you that you can, and it'll just blend out beautifully. So anyways, that's the, that's the secret of the base layer, but that's not only for that. If you kind of have a nice base coating down there, and if you kind of approach every kind of layer of ink that way, what you get in the end result is a much more 
kind of vibrant glowing surface right there. You see how that make, it makes it look like the kind of light is emanating from within the uh, the scene, you know, which is, you know, the thing that it, that's what it's representing. It's representing light, right? But it's not light in this scene right here. You know, it's just contrast. We have it light in the middle, lighter in value in the middle, and darker on the outside edge. So that's how you get that nice colored glow. Let's make it glow even more. Let's try to introduce some of this uh, Caribbean blue right here. Now, Danube blue was, uh, you know, a darker value than this Caribbean blue. So let me just kind of take some of this ink out of here. Okay. And let's take a look and see how it's going to look. Okay, it's kind of brighter. Marvy inks are very, very bright, okay? Bright is not the same as light, okay? Light is the relative light dark. Brightness is the relative dull intense, okay? All right, so sometimes you want a little bit more intensity. I like the kind of the more, you know, muted colors sometimes, but sometimes I like a little brightness too. Sometimes it almost gets too bright if I use only Marvy inks, okay? So that's why I like using a combination of bright and dull. You can get the brightness out of other, you know, colors, uh, other lines of inks, but I haven't really come across um, a brand as bright as Marvy colors. Just in general, there might be another brighter color you know, within a given line, but just in terms of overall. But do you see that kind of saturation right there and brightness? Now, see, one of the things you want to be careful about, I mean, if you do take out all that light, that's not a problem. It's just you don't have it, I don't know, it's later on in the day or something like that. But um, you do want to be careful. If you want to retain kind of the lightest areas, just don't tone them out. Okay, so I'm kind of adding this in my darker areas. Now, even though this is a lighter color, the Danube blue is kind of showing stronger, but it's a much more vibrant, intense version of that blue because you have this, you know, influencing what you see in the end result, okay? I mean, we see the, the black, you know, impression right here, but, you know, while these colors are going over the top of it, you know, the colors, the darkest thing is going to be the thing that shows up. So we see more of the Danube blue, but it's, like I said, it's more of a kind of an intense version of it, okay? So let's take a look right here. Now let's do a little comparison contrast. You know, let's take a, a little bit of a lesson in layering inks, okay? Let me show you just the Danube blue alone, okay? I'll show you what tone this is, okay? It's a nice color, certainly. But this is Danube blue alone, okay? All right, see that? But now let's take a look at, look at all these other colors. Think. Look how much rich, you know, richer this looks, you know? than this one right here. It looks a little bit plain, doesn't it? Now see, that's what you get from all those colors, you know, transparent colors. All right, now let's take this even further though, okay? Uh, what I think, uh, when do you know to move on to the next color? It's when you keep adding it in the darkest areas and it's just not getting any darker, using that existing ink in a stronger saturation, you know, using more of it, okay? It's not gonna get any darker you know, the more I add with that color. So that's when you know you can move on to your next tone, okay? Or next value or whatever color you're working with. Um, let's see, I do have my Prussian blue. Here's a kind of a navy blue. It's just called blue from Marvy. It's the number three. All right, now this is roughly the same value. It, it, kind of looks the same, doesn't it? Eh, maybe this indexing is a little bit darker than this Danube blue. But because this is a thicker ink in viscosity than the Marvy one, okay, it gets a greater penetration into the surface past all of those thicker inks, okay? And look how much darker it gets right here. See, I'll use it in this little corner. You see how much darker it is right here than here? But now look at that, you know, I'm, I'm just working 
kind of incrementally a little bit darker each step, so it's not a huge jump in value. Especially if I just put a few tabs down, you can barely tell the difference. But if I keep adding it down, um, it does get you know darker and darker. Sometimes with the Danube blue or something like that, it's it's such a thick ink, you know, it's it really doesn't get too much darker than whatever it's going to get. Maybe if you kind of let the inks dry on here a little bit more, you know, um, then you can get a darker version of the, like say that Danube blue, but. With the Marv inks, because it's a thinner viscosity, it just, you know, it gets darker pretty fast. So it's, it's you know, it's good to mix and match if you have it, or if you kind of want to expand on your pad collection. A lot of you don't have Marvies out there. They weren't terribly, you know, well uh, advertised, I guess, you know. It's one of those things having a kind of an international um, entity. They, they're not really in tune <laughs> with the uh, things that are going on, but they are really excellent inks. Now, this isn't a Marvy crowd. I don't have any kind of affiliation with them whatsoever. Um, but um, I don't know, like a two or three of their blues would be a good, um, and I would just go with the reinker, you know. Eh, the pad's okay. They don't have the pads anymore, but they have a blank pad and the reinker, you know. Unless you're going to be stamping out um, impressions with these colors right here, all you need to do is get the reinker. The reinker holds so much more ink than the uh, the pad anyway, and it's just as easy for me to put a couple drops out of the, you know this dark blue and just sap it up, sop it up, and just apply it that way. You know, so um, why not just get the reinker, you know, and save a few bucks and that reinker. You know, I, I don't know. It depends how much you're, how much, you know, how much of a sta scenic stamper you are. Probably, if you're doing this kind of technique right here or whatever. But uh, what I'm getting at is that reinker could last you, you know, forever. You don't need to get a bunch of them. You know, I, I mean, I, I stamp out a decent amount of scenes, and I, those things just last me forever. I'm rarely throwing away a reinker bottle, you know, and going empty, and, you know, and tossing it. Maybe back when with the black ones, but, you know, I was using them a lot in make and takes and workshops and things like that, so we're talking about sharing it with 20 people, you know, for, for a three hour period, so we were doing a fair share of uh, reinking, but even so, you know, it just really lasts a long time. Okay. Getting to a kind of a nice um, glow here, you know, a nice color scheme, whatnot. When I'm using blues, sometimes if I don't use enough blues, it looks a little bit dull, I would say. So I do like going through a pretty full spec. This is the Prussian blue. It's really beautiful. Uh, there was a really great Adirondack blue called Denim. I think my, my Denim is kind of dry, and like I said, those ones are discontinued too, so... Um, I really love a really, really dark blue, and this Prussian blue. The Prussian blue, for some reason, too, it's a different viscosity than all the other Marvies. Marvies are thin, but Prussian blue, it, the ink almost seems to have, like, a different chemistry, so. One of the things I'm doing here, kind of in the shadows, you know, um, is I'm kind of doing this type of thing. I have a really um, small kind of area of the, my applicator, you know, my sponge tip that I'm using, because I'm just using it for on its side here, and I'm putting, you know, some shadows down by these um, rocks right here. I have this uh, video on uh, easy lighting schemes, <laughs> and it really is, believe it or not, um, it's very, very easy, and it's one that I use on, I don't know, I wouldn't be surprised if it's on 80% of my scenes, but it's just thing... That just looks like um, this. I have an area of light somewhere. Let's say, like this one right here. There's an area of light here, and an area of light here. Meaning, all this area in here gets filled in with tone. Okay. We have light source and reflected light. Light source and reflected light. Light source, reflected light. But see it down here. But 
in order for it to be reflected light down here and just not to be all light in the middle, you have to have some kind of darkness in between. So that's where this is right here. You see light, dark light. Yeah, this one's a little bit different, but it is kind of like this. It's like light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. You know what I mean? For that northern uh, Aurora Borealis. It's lighter up here in the sky. Rocks are darker, lighter down here in the water. It doesn't have to be a reflective type of surface either, like a lake. You can have a meadow down below, and that's just lighter. It's an easy thing to do, you know. It's, I don't know, if you want, just kind of, you know, if you don't want to have to think about lighting, you know, then just kind of... Uh, practice that um, kind of scheme, lighting scheme, I guess. It's like an eight almost, you know, it's like this. Okay, that's the Prussian blue. Look how beautiful that one is. It's really um, deep and vibrant, and look at that glow. Okay, so where did my black go? Let's go to black. Go in the corners. Now, when you get to the darker tones, just don't take it in quite as far, okay? Just kind of stick to the outside edge. And now look, look at this. I'm kind of working this corner. And I'm not really going into the scene very far. I'm not thinking about this corner, this corner, and this corner right now. I'm just working one corner, and that's how I get a really nice gradation, because I'm sticking to that one area. Sometimes when, you know, we think about kind of making the perimeter darker, we're thinking about a perimeter application going like this, 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 okay? And then what happens is they get these types of marks, oops, sorry, these types of marks all around their paper, like, you know, like that, okay? But you don't want that. You want to just kind of See this right here? This type of application, see how it's like darker and lighter? Well, that's all I'm doing right here. See, here's darker. Staying in there now. Now this page is a little bit wet, so it's, you know, it's not coming off of my tip as fast because the page is so soaked, so it's not transferring over very fast. Now that, you want that though, because it makes it easier to blend your colors in a nice graceful manner. But see how I'm just staying in that one area like that? Okay. And now, when I come over here, there aren't any, you know, tip marks or anything like that. I'm also not squeezing this, you know, like doing this type of application here. I'm just lightly tapping this on like that. And you see, I'm just concentrating the color. And that way, you know, for me, it just makes for a nice and easy process. I don't have to kind of, you know, go back in and blend in any kind of uh, mistakes or unintentional marks, such as a... Uh, oval shape, right? I just turned my card. One of the things that, um, this is like one of your first videos uh, that you watched from me. One of the things I mentioned is kind of keeping your kind of hands in a nice ergonomic motion, okay? Now see, if I'm doing this right here, my eyesight is looking at this. I can't see beyond this, so I turn it like this. And see, I'm looking right down into this. I can see it much better from the side. So I'm kind of, I kind of have this up here too. So I'm kind of looking underneath it too. But look at this, this is my hand's natural motion right here, okay? I'm in a nice natural position. Ergonomic keyboards tended to kind of go like that a little bit. So you can see this right here. You don't have to kind of, you know, this is a, you know, there's a little repetition in here, but my wrist is really loose, okay? And relaxed, okay? I mean, I'm barely holding this. I'm just going like this, basically. I'm not going like this, you know? See how stiff everything is? And then I'm absorbing all this. My shoulders would get sore. Okay, so just, and this is a very light, you know, tool here in the uh, um, color box stylus tool. These wands are very light. And it, you know, it is important to think about your, how you're sitting, your positioning and whatnot, okay? So in other words, this whole process is very incremental. It's very comfortable. And you don't always have to apply inks with your scene facing right up. See, like this, if I do it like this, and I'm coming over here, it's 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 moving out of my kind of my ergonomic 
comfort zone, you might say. Okay, getting my shadows in here a little bit more. Look at this, kind of adding a little bit of shading around these rocks makes them seem much more uh, kind of opaque, you know, by giving them some shading. Where do you add shadows? Well, you can just look at the image itself and there are shadows on the images. And that's where I'm adding more tone in the impression of that image, okay? But look at this, kind of adding some right down here at the base of it. It gives those rocks some kind of visual weight, you know, and mass. You know, it gives them visual weight. It, they just look like they're set into the scene much more, I don't know, kind of fully uh, as far as the illusion goes. Okay, they're not floating around like that. All right, there we go. If anyone likes blues, now I love blue, blue, you know, the color blue too. So I really like to uh, utilize a lot of them, but look at that, how deep that saturation is. Look at these blues down here like that. Even though I had a lot of black down here, but look at what it did. It kind of adding a darker version of that right over here made that seem much more kind of lighter and more vibrant. And it has that really nice, I don't know, I guess color glow, you know, for lack of a better kind of a term. All right. Sometimes people say, oh, you should keep this and do something with that. Yeah, abstract piece. All right, that is good there. I can go on with blues forever. I don't know, not that it would change anything, but. Um, okay, now let's see here. Let's add in our foreground imagery. You can see how much saturation is here um, on this card. So that's, I don't know, I didn't add these in. Um, to begin with, because I knew I was going to go over them a lot. I don't know, sometimes I think that if you save it for the end, the impressions look a little bit more crisp. Now these ones I had to get down here because otherwise where are you going to know to add in some shadows? So you have to kind of establish your, you know, those types of images, but I'm not going to put any shadows around, you know, these reeds here or something like that, so I don't need to do that. But now here's one of the things that's fun too. If you're doing kind of a winter scene, let's say it's got really dark down here and you won't even be able to see these reeds right here. It's fun to stamp them out in, you know, white um, pigment ink or something like that. It's kind of fun. It gives it a kind of a, uh, I wouldn't say a realistic look, but there's like an ice covered um, foreground image or something like that. That's, I don't know, that's what I think about when I see something like that. But look at these. Um, and just like how fun this is to add in. You probably can't even see that one, but look how beautiful those look like that, you know, having those reeds like that. See that right there? See what it does in here? It does go over our blues, but it, it just makes those blues seem even more, I don't know, lighter and more vibrant. But look at the space in this scene now with those reeds in there. Okay, let's add some more to this side. Re-ink in between impressions because you want these ones really dark. Okay, like something like that. Okay, look at that depth in there. I don't know, I, I love uh, getting to this uh, point in, in terms of like the compositional build of it. I love adding foreground things like that. One of these days, I, I always talk about it all the time, but it, I always thought it would be kind of be fun to like do some detailed embossing in the foreground so that those they're actually dimensional, you know, and they would be raised, you know, detail embossed black. Wouldn't that be cool? Or, you know, I was talking about stamping those out in white. It would be like a brilliance white pigment ink, something that's going to dry on glossy very easily. Or you can just emboss something on white or silver, you know, and silver in a 
a cool blue scene would be a, an interesting touch, you know, for foregrounds. It doesn't look realistic, you know, when you do that, but, you know, as, as far as a design element, um, why not, you know? We don't always have to kind of go off of a, kind of our idea of realism or something like that. I'm holding this down a little bit, you know, because I know that area up there is pretty saturated with the ink. So I want to make sure that this ink, I give this ink a chance to transfer um, uh, over to the uh, card. Um, so that, you know, in our conversations and discussions on the message boards, I've asking what people's um, favorite black inks were to use, and some people really like Versafine, which I love too. Versafine is a black pigment ink, and it takes a while to dry on this type of glossy, but it does eventually, but um, that's a beautiful black ink on here. It's, I wouldn't say it's raised, I mean, maybe on a microscopic sense, it is raised off the surface because, you know, it's pigment, so it's kind of laying on the surface of the card and not really penetrating like a dye would. And those are really, you know, it's a really great pad for um, foreground imagery. You just have to be careful that you don't kind of wipe it. Even, sometimes even the next day it's still wet. Um, and, it, you know, I've sprayed them too sometimes with like a spray sealant or a workable fixative or something like that, like a Krylon. And sometimes even after that, they're still a little bit wet. So, you know what I mean? You can use it, but just don't, I don't know, maybe don't mail it to anyone real soon, you know, if you're getting stuff done like early then you don't need to worry about it okay so there's my branches up here all right i moved a touch with that one so it's a little bit smudgy but that's all right it's um shaking in the wind in a breeze <laughs> that was what that was always what we would say if someone did that in the in class oh don't worry about it, it just looks like it's kind of moving in the room you know there's a breeze there and they would say, oh, okay. All right. So what's going to change this scene, you know, or I don't know, like any of these from into something of a wintry type of look, okay, from something like a just an everyday twilight type of thing. Well, these white gel pens are really fantastic. This one happens to be a Uniball Signo pen. It's from Japan. This one happens to be made in Japan. I don't know if all of them are that are the one point. Oh, let me see how close I can get um, that. See, it has that kind of gold. It has that kind of Japanese writing on it. Um, I use the other types too. I, I use the point sevens. These ones are probably domestic. Are they? I don't know. It doesn't say where it's made here on this one. It might be made in Japan too, but um, these ones are kind of nice. These 1.0s are, I guess it's because it's a thicker ink or something like that, uh, or a thicker ball roller. They don't clog as much. I have uh, pretty good success with most of the Uniballs, and I do have this other set here, this uh, shuttle art, but this one's really opaque though, this white here, so. All right, that being said, um, let's go in here and let's start doing, I don't know, this is like first snowfall of the year. Everything's not, you notice me, you know, I, all my trees aren't covered in snow, obviously. So maybe this is like a first snowfall type of thing. I like adding this in for stars as well, but when you do it like in mass like this, um, and you know, certainly if you put, put it over the top of, um, your imagery like trees and stuff it represents that texture kind of falling you know in front of it too right so thus instead of just a few dots in the sky as stars you've changed that dot pattern to now being snow hopefully hopefully it's not something like ash you know always wild fires um, all over the place these days. It's kind of 
like a, it's almost like you're adding some kind of like screen, you know, over the top of this. Um, seeing a textured screen of some sort. I'm talking about, I'm not talking about like a screen door, but just a kind of a layer of something. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit more here. I'm really horrible with this and I apologize, but I'll try to keep this in. Okay, let me just, I'll work this scene like this. Normally, I, like I said, I turn my card for, but I'll try to keep this within the field of view so I don't start working off screen. Okay, now, sometimes you can kind of, you know, change the uh, size of some of these, you know, just for variation. You know, it could be like a little snowflake that's much closer to you, right? So do some kind of a little bit larger. So when I do that, I don't hit it harder. Some people kind of do that, and I, or, and I see them doing this type of you know, technique. I don't know if I would do that technique. You start getting like, um, you know, it's kind of like a really irregular, you know, a little choppy look. If you want to do that, you can, you know, if you want that kind of texture on there, but uh, I think, it, you know, if you haven't done this before, I'd recommend kind of a more controlled application, you know, it's not it doesn't take too long, you know, to do something like this. You see, I'm kind of putting some little patchy snow on tops of some of these rocks. kind of build some up a little bit. That's where it's kind of reflecting in this light around here, okay? Maybe I won't put too much. Maybe I'll put a few little patches on my water surface, you know. I won't put too much of it like this. You went be able to see it so much in the shadows. So I'm adding this mostly in the lighter areas. As far as, you know, the things, you know, where it represents being on some kind of object or surface here. In this case, it's on the, uh, the water down here. Let's see, let's put a little bit of more snow on some of these. All right, now I happen to, <laughs> it's, it's, sometimes it shows up a little bit too much. So we have our blue pigment ink, okay? It's a blue colored scheme, right? So let's add some uh, blue where it would be otherwise too um, light in white. Now this is almost too dark blue. Let me see if I have a lighter. There, I think I do. Here's the sig... Um, the Shuttle Art 180 pen gel pen set that I bought. I think I bought it for $20. I think it went up to like 30, but I don't know, 180 colors and they come with 180 refills. You know, yeah, this one's good. Now this is why I bought these, because I wanted some variation. I wanted some lighter values of uh, some colors. I do have a video showing the uh, Shuttle Art gel pen set if you want to watch that. Um, just look that up. Shuttle art uh, gel pens on the Stampscapes channel. But anyways, I can add some blues in here. and You know, of course it uh, harmonizes with this color scheme because blue, you know, it, this is a blue color scheme and I'm using a blue gel pen, so if you use the blue gel pen, it just represents kind of a lighter area when you add it into a, something darker, but it's not so light as white, okay? So it's like here and there. The shuttle art ones are not quite as uh, opaque, which can be good too. You know, you can use that to your advantage. Maybe, maybe I, you don't want something so you know, to stand out so the colors underneath will um, influence that tone a little bit. Okay, let me get some small little 
highlights on here as well, going back to the white one, so I can have variations of blue and white build up on each other, okay? Just like you have variations of blue down here. All right, let's see what I'm kind of going after right here. It's more of a wintry type of thing, or the winter is coming, you know, first snowfall or whatever. It's one of those days where there's some snowfall, but daytime it warms up and burns off and it keeps going through that same process. Maybe this is something like that, you know, or represents something like that. So you can kind of get, you know, you can go for some little smaller little s snowflakes in here just for that variation. It kind of gives that little twinkly look. Oh, okay, now we have some little snow on these uh, rocks right here. Let's add some on some of these branches of these trees, okay? Let's start off with um, uh, this branch up here. This is the oak branch. It's kind of hanging. And this will kind of mask my uh, little blurriness, you know. I was talking too much and I held that down for too long. Plus the page is a little bit wet too, so. Put a couple little crisp highlights down here on some of these branches. Don't do it too much, okay? Because it is in kind of darkness, so you wouldn't be able to see little reflective qualities, right? Things reflect that have light shining on them, okay? So there's my little uh, light. Yeah, it looks like little snow on the branches, right? And it's because it's in the light. Now, if I put that amount of white over here in the sh shade, it might look kind of funny, you know? Because it's saying, if it's dark over here, we're saying that there's no light hitting over there. So there's, you know what I mean? That snow on those branches wouldn't reflect. So in other words, when I start doing this, I just start adding these little highlights in my lighter areas. You can see, I have that little pattern down here with that little, um, I don't know, that, I don't know, the lake uh, texture on there or snowfall or whatever, but I don't have it over here because that white would show up too extreme over here, right? I have darker blue pens, but I don't know. I, I don't want to do everything like that. If you don't know, add a little bit of something. Okay, let's say, all right. Uh, this is a really forgiving thing. Let's say I add some, you know, here. There's my little happy face, right? I don't like it. Comes right off, right? What can be more forgiving than that? Everything I do, you know, is kind of an easy, very forgiving process. You notice I work really incrementally, but in the end, hopefully it looks like a nice complex you know, looking thing, but, you know, if you don't like something, now I can't say, oh, I didn't like that, uh, you know, oak branch there in black, I'm going to wipe it off, that's not going to come off, but, like these little touches like this, you know, I mean, I add them one, you know, I'm literally adding them one at a time, it's not like I'm going to go like that, oh, I ruined the scene, or should I put a dot there, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have done that, you know what I mean? It ruined the whole thing. I mean, you're just adding one thing at a time, so. And then when you're adding inks, you're just going a little bit incrementally, a little bit darker and darker, and you're adding more layers, you know. It happens kind of in a very gradual fashion, and there's a lot of control over it. That being said, I too can go, you know, can apply some things that I don't like. It's because I'm working in such a little detailed area, so it's important to kind of Take your scene and look at it from distance every now and then to get a feel for what you're doing, you know, hold it out and take a look at it, you know. And then, you know, you can do your detailed work like this, but every now and then pull it back and, see, you know, see what it, it's looking like, you know, in the overall, okay? All right, now let's go back to those trees here. Let's go with these pine trees and let's add a little bit of snow reflecting off of it, off of some of these branches. See what that does? It kind of makes the, you know, a two-dimensional impression, which all rubber stamping really is, you know, we're working in 2D, even though things 
in this case, like this, they're supposed to represent three dimensions, but here, I'll do this on this side, and not on this side. You, you can take a look at that tree there. See those trees right over there? They seem a little bit more dimensional than these trees, right? A few little dots like that. I don't do this on every scene, you know. Um, but adding a few little dots like that, it's saying that the tree is dimensional, so something on it is catching the uh, the light in some way, meaning, you know, there's some dimensions to it. It's not just flat, okay? Okay, all right, let's do some on this foreground one. This is the pines and rocks tree here in the foreground. Yeah, a couple too big of a dots, but no big deal. Like I said, I can just wipe them right off if I want. But anyway, see that? It's a little bit more wintry feeling, I think, you know, but little, little dots like that. Okay, here's some reeds down here. Do I want to do that? Mm -hmm. Why not? Let's try it. If I don't like it, I can just wipe it right off. As long as those reeds are dry, okay? I don't want to wipe it off and, oh my god, that black ink was still wet and I smear it all. Okay, watch this. A couple of little dots on a reed branch here and there. Okay, don't do it over everything. And don't do it like all up the whole thing and then it looks like Christmas lights on it. But see that right there? Just a few little dots here and there. Maybe the blue one would be even better, but you know, not too bad. You know, that white one. It kind of pulls them out from the background, doesn't it? It makes them seem a little bit more dimensional. Let's do the same on over here. Okay. Remember, I, I wouldn't do it on every single one. Just, I don't know. Pick one. It doesn't matter which one over the other, too. I'm not making some kind of major life decision. You know, I'm just kind of choosing one. I'm just not doing it on all of them. That's my only kind of mandate for myself here. Okay, there we go. A little bit more wintry though, huh? White gel pen. It works wonders. Sometimes a white gel pen too. Um, doing this, it it can kind of um, save a scene in terms of uh, having something that kind of blase maybe, you know, to something a little bit more dynamic. Now you take all these little white dots out of here and the scene looked okay. You know, as far as the, but, you know, did it say, it didn't have this type of statement as far as, like, you know, this is, you know, a, a real kind of seasonal statement, you know, as far as, okay, this is, this is winter now, you know what I mean? Whereas before it could have been just a cool, you know, nighttime, could have been summer, summer night, you know, even in those blue tones, you know, or twilight or whatever. Now this really says winter. Not that you have to add this on everything, but... Um, and you don't have to use this brand, you know. You, chances are you might have a, a different type of thing. Some people use correctional pens, you know. That's what, that's what we used to do, you know, back in the old days, you know, not to kind of do one of those things where you say, oh, you know, we, we used all this, but it, it, it was true. We, we didn't have, you know, there weren't accessories really being made for, you know, the the rubber stamping kind of crowd, you know, the craft paper crafters, you know, the gel pens weren't out there all together. So there were white paint pens that I used to use, but some people just used correctional pens because that's what they had. It's, I'd say it's a little bit harder because they're not really meant to draw everywhere, you know, very freely, but it worked pretty good. There's a, those other things. I think it was, was it called liquid applique or something like that? It's that kind of thicker thing. People would put that on rocks and that looked really cool. It was really raised. But anyway, okay. I think that is enough there. There is a winter card there. Wouldn't be, that'd be kind of interesting to be kind of framed off in a matted and a, a blue and maybe a, a silver paper or something like that and placed on a 
some kind of card, maybe a dark card or a navy blue or a black thing. Then you can write on the inside or you can open up the card and if it's on, you know, navy blue, you can kind of emboss, you know, happy holidays or whatever in there or something like that. But anyways, it's not fun. It certainly adds life to um, certain areas in here. Uh, I should do a firefly scene using the, uh, the white gel pen, or, you know, just gel pens in another scene. Uh, upcoming. Oh, I know what I'll do. In this scene right here, I'll do this composition to what I'll make this um, meadow down here. I haven't done that yet, so. I've, I've been doing lakes on all of my uh, compositions so far, but you can use this entire composition just if you color this all in. Don't color in your reflections down here and just do green then it's grass, right? Or you can do a nighttime scene like this, whatever. But anyway, okay. Fun with blues and fun with the gel pen for sure. Okay, look at that deep blue uh, color scheme. Look at that vibrant blue around there. A lot of that Prussian blue, but the Prussian blue isn't only doing it, it's all the colors underneath. So layer your colors down and, uh, you know, I would recommend uh, if you have it, go with Ray Inker. Really get it slathered, you know, to begin with, and it really makes it for a quick uh, introduction to your color application process when you utilize your uh, Ray Inker um, uh, inks in kind of that manner. You get a lot of coverage very quickly. All right, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, drop me a note. And uh, if you have any further questions on the line in general, the uh, website at stampscapes.com has a lot of information, especially in the info section under materials, back, or just the uh, what is Stampscapes link. Okay, thanks for watching.